And one of the last words my mother asked me, she said, did I, I did my duty, didn't I? And I said, above and beyond. And, uh, and I'll never forget those words she, she said to me because she felt that um, her life and her, her main purpose in life was to warn the West. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure that you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Igor Guzhenko exposed the Soviet intelligence efforts to steal nuclear secrets as well as the technique of planting sleeper agents. The Guzhenko affair is often credited as a triggering event of the Cold War with historian Jack Granitstein stating that it was the beginning of the Cold War for public opinion, and journalist Robert Fulford writing that he was absolutely certain the Cold War began in Ottawa. I talk with Andrew Kavchak, the author of Remembering Guzhenko, The Struggle to Honour a Cold War Hero, and Evie Wilson, the daughter of Igor and Svetlana Guzhenko. There'll be further details, including a link to Andrew's book in our show notes, which will be showing as a link in your podcast app. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can show your support via a monthly donation via Patreon. Plus, you will get the sought after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. But don't take my word for it. Let's hear from Tim Slansky, one of our supporters. I'm Tim from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially because of the great research and the quality of the storytelling. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. I'm delighted to welcome Andrew and Evie to our Cold War conversation. Igor Guzenko was a Soviet GRU cipher clerk. And uh, to understand what happened in the Guzenko affair, I think it's important to to contextualize it by you know having an idea of what what happened in in, in World War II and in relations between Canada and the Soviet Union. Uh, at the beginning of the war, Canada hadn't didn't have any relations with the Soviets. That in fact it had none since the Bolshevik Revolution. When the Soviets signed the Non-Aggression Pact with the Nazis, the famous Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. Um, It included the secret protocols for the splitting of their spheres of influence, including the division of Poland. So on September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland and took over half the country. On September 17th, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east and took over their half of the country. Now, Britain and France declared war on Germany on September 3rd. Canada declared war on September 10th, but nobody subsequently declared war on the Soviets following their invasion of Poland. Now, Canada, like I said, didn't have any relations with the Soviets, and this Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact didn't help the situation because during that period from 39 to 41, the Soviets and the Nazis were helping each other. The Soviets were supplying Nazis with raw materials and so on. Andrew, what was the Canadian Communist Party up to at this point? The communists in Canada, the Communist Party being given its instructions from from Moscow, were basically told to do everything they could to thwart the war effort. And so in 1940, the Communist Party in Canada was banned. And, you know, the leaders were either arrested or went into hiding. But of course, all of that changed on June 22nd, 1941, with launching of Operation Barbarossa and the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. So suddenly the Soviets 
were in a struggle in common with the West against Hitler and Nazism. So Canada and the Soviet Union, along with all the other Western allies, developed, uh, uh, opened up relations with the Soviets. Uh, both countries opened missions in their respective countries. And Igor Guzenko, who was born in the Soviet Union in 1919, was a uh, architecture student before the war, was uh, caught up in the mobilization, brought into the uh, Red Army, assigned to the GRU, uh, Soviet military intelligence, became a cipher clerk, and was sent to the Canadian embassy in 1943 with a cover of being a civilian employee, but in fact, he was a GRU operative who was coding and decoding messages going back and forth to the Soviet headquarters, the, the center. He was working for the uh, military attache Zabotin. And over the course of his time in Canada, in night, between 40, 43 and 45, he came to realize that much of what he had been told about Western capitalist societies was false. Uh, he came to appreciate the, the freedom that he observed in the country. And he also became aware of the fact that the Soviets, in spite of the fact that on the surface they were claiming to be allies, were in fact operating a deep penetrating spy network. And in fact, there were several spy networks. The NKVD had a spy network. Uh, the Naval Intelligence had a spy network. But he was aware of the GRU spy network, which not only included an MP who was a recruiter for the network, an MP by the name of Fed Rose, and, but it also included a number of agents within the Canadian government and the Department of uh, the military, as well as external affairs, as well as the registrar at the British High Commission here in Ottawa. And on top of it all, a number of uh, spies who had penetrated the Manhattan Project, the development of the atomic bomb, which was a, a project between the British and the Americans. Um, at one point, the, the, uh, the two allies asked Canada to become involved, not only because we offered an opportunity for the British scientists to come to Montreal to be closer to the Americans, but also we had uranium as well as a uranium refinery. And uh, what happened then at the end of the war, the uh, you know Americans bombed the Japanese Hiroshima and Nagasaki with the atomic bombs on August 6th and 9th. VJ Day was pronounced a few days later but the World War II came to an end officially September 2nd, when the Japanese surrendered on the deck of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay to General MacArthur. And I think the whole world expected at that time that there would be a peace dividend and peace would break out. And <laughs> well, if the period after World War II is characterized in the history books as the Cold War, the very first significant international incident of that Cold War happened just three days after the Japanese surrender when Igor Guzenko walked out of the Soviet embassy with 109 documents under his shirt exposing the extent of Soviet espionage in Canada, which had also penetrated um, the governments in the United Kingdom as well as the United States. And Guzenko planned this in advance. He had planned this with his wife, Svetlana. They had a two-year-old son at the time, and Svetlana was pregnant. And they were taking a huge risk because they had no pre-arranged um, contact or plan uh, that had been made for you know an escape and evacuation. I think it's important to keep in mind that. It was not, not that long before when, for example, a, a Soviet spy by the name of Ignazi Reis in Western Europe, I think it was in, a, uh, in Switzerland, sent a letter to, to Stalin saying that he didn't want to do any more espionage for Stalin. And a month later, Ignazi Reis was, was found murdered. So um, what happened was 
Igor Glazenko walked into the night editorial offices of the Ottawa Journal with an objective of making the story front page news so that if something did happen to him, that at least the world would know. And unfortunately, the editor at the Ottawa Journal had the scoop of the century right in his lap, lap and <laughs> he, he ignored it and basically said, uh, come back the next day or go see the police. But he wasn't going to he wasn't going to deal with it. Why didn't he go to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police first? No, no, he, he, he didn't go first to the police because he had reason to believe that the police may be uh, already infiltrated by, by, by potentially by KGB spies or NKVD at that time. And so his objective was not to go to, to, to the police, uh, but to, to blow the lid off the spy ring network and make it public by going to the media. So after the night editor re, re, uh, sent him away, uh, he went to the offices of the justice minister. But it, by that time, it was late at night, and the, uh, the commissioner got guard at the building said, look, there's nobody here. Come back tomorrow. So he went back to his apartment, went back the next day to the offices of the Ottawa Journal, and the editor there at the time said, look, this is uh, not possible. Our, you know, Stalin is our ally. If you've got a serious problem with this, uh, this, you know, uh, go, go see the police. So he went back to the offices of the Minister of Justice, who was Louis Saint Laurent, who later became prime minister, and waited for two hours asking to see the minister on a very important matter. Now, what he didn't know was that during that time, the prime, the minister contacted the offices of the prime minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King. So Guzenko was starting to be known within the highest rungs of the hierarchy or ladder within the federal government in Ottawa. Unfortunately, Mackenzie King, even though he was, you know, prime minister for longer than any uh, prime minister in any Commonwealth country, and he did so by being a very shrewd politician. His handling of this matter was somewhat disturbing because his initial reaction was that they should send Guzenko back to the Russian embassy because this might harm relations with the Soviets. Now, fortunately, he had some advisors uh, who advised him against that. And it was decided to have the RCMP follow Guzenko. And so after waiting for two hours in the minister's office, he was told that the minister would not see him. So then he went to the Crown, Crown uh, Prosecutor's Office to apply for naturalization and uh, was told that that process takes uh, a long time. And so he returned back to his apartment with his wife, and they asked a neighbor if they could stay there for the night, because by this time at the embassy, they had already recognized that Buzenko didn't show up for work, and there were documents missing. In fact, somebody from the chauffeur of the KGB head, Pavlov, came to it and knocked on Buzenko's apartment door. So they went to a neighbor who kindly let them stay overnight there. Guzenko looked out the window of this apartment at 511 Somerset Street in downtown Ottawa. Across the street, there's a park. And on the park bench, he saw two men. And he says in his autobiography that he was scared that they were NKVD sent to watch where he was, not knowing that he was in that apartment of the neighbor. And in fact, it turns out they were RCMP. So during the middle of the night, between the 6th and the 7th of September, the KGB four thugs, Pavlov and some of his thugs from the embassy, came to the building, broke into Guzenko's apartment looking for him, as well as the documents that he took. And the neighbor where Guzenko was hiding called the city police. The city police eventually came to the building, but were rebuffed by the, the Soviets who said this was an internal diplomatic matter. 
The next day, the RCMP came to the apartment where Guzenko was hiding and brought him in for debriefing. And what happened afterwards was it was all kept under wraps by the Canadian government, although the prime minister traveled to Washington and London to inform the president, the new president, Truman, as well as the new pr prime minister, Attlee, about this development. And the FBI, as well as the MI5 and MI6 became involved in the investigations. All of these organizations were seeking to find or catch the spies in the process of spying in order to have the necessary evidence to be able to prosecute them. So how many spies did they immediately capture? Uh, unfortunately, in uh, the, the United States, the FBI wasn't able to capture anybody in the act of spying, in part because uh, <laughs> the word immediately went out within the Soviet spy networks to lay low. In fact, Mitrokin afterwards in the Mitrokin archives said that the defection resulted in Soviet espionage being frozen and set back at least 15 years in Canada. But uh, in uh, February 1946, the American media broke the story uh, at the beginning of February. And on February 5th, 1946, the federal government of Canada appointed a royal commission with two Supreme Court justices to conduct an inquiry into as foreign espionage in Canada. And they interviewed, of course, uh, Guzenko. And within a week, they advised the government that there was enough evidence and basis upon which to start arresting suspected spies. So on the 15th, I think it was, there were approximately uh, a dozen espionage suspects who were arrested by the RCMP. And in total, there were about 20, 20 spies who were arrested, half of whom were convicted. The other half were not due to lack of evidence. But these people included one, one MP, um, the first of the atom bomb spies, Alan Nunn May, who was a British scientist who came to Canada, who provided some samples to the Soviets. He returned to Great Britain and was arrested on the same day that Churchill made his famous Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri. And he ended up being convicted. Um, there were a number of uh, other high, high profile scientists, most notably Ro Raymond Boyer, who was a uh, a uh, scientist in Montreal who assisted in the development of a explosive known as RDX, which was apparently considerably more powerful than dynamite. And he provided uh, the formula to the Soviets. He ended up being uh, prosecuted and found uh, uh, guilty. And uh, so these were in the late 1940s, the, the Canadian spy trials. And it had a significant impact, of course, on politics. The Communist Party, which was very popular at the beginning of the 30s, uh, sank in popularity as it should have. And uh, Guzenko ended up living with his wife and children with an assumed name. And he wrote his autobiography in 1948 called This Was My Choice which was turned into a Hollywood movie. Uh, he wrote a uh, novel, The Fall of the Titan, in 1954, which won a Governor General's Award. And unfortunately, he passed away in 1982. And Svetlana passed away in 2001. Aside from Alan Nunn May, what other foreign nationals did Guzenko exposed? Uh, Guzenko exposed in the United States that there was an assistant to an assistant 
of the Secretary of State, who was a Soviet agent. And this, in the end, turned out to be Alger Hiss. But at the time, it, it sent the NBI, FBI into convulsions, trying to figure out who this person could be. And as you know, uh, he was suspected and during the McCarthy era was uh, identified as being a suspect. And I think in the end, he was originally convicted on, on a charge of perjury. And it's only later when the Soviet archives were open to the historians that the truth was revealed. With it, with, but within the, the United Kingdom, he revealed that there were in fact two spies, Soviet spies, with the same code name, believe it or not, one of them being Eli. And one of the Eli's, he, which he did expose in Ottawa, was a registrar at the British High Commission. But the other Eli was somewhere in um, the British intelligence community. And this, you know, <laughs> there are many books written by people like Pat Chapman, Pincher, and, and all these others over in the, the 80s and 90s about who, who was Eli. Um, my, my, my recollection is that in the end, it turned out to be uh, Ken Cross. Yeah, he was one of the Cambridge Five. But the problem, of course, with all of the revelations concerning the UK was that one of the senior officers who was involved in liaison with the, Amer the Canadians and who was distilling and distributing whatever information came out or fr from the Canadians about the Guzenko affair was none other than Kim Philby. Mm. And so uh, a couple of years ago, for example, there was a British uh, academic who made a, a, an arrangement with MI6 of, uh, you know, being able to s study their, their files and write a book with their authority, giving them the right to uh, vet, it, vet the final product. And I can't remember the, the, the name of the, the author, but what happened was there was a book review in the Ottawa newspapers a couple of years ago about this particular history of, of the MI6. And <laughs> of all the things that this book review could have focused on, I thought it was very interesting that it focused on one particular element of the book, which involved how Kim Philby thwarted the Guzenko investigation. Basically, he distributed messages throughout the government in the UK saying that, oh, this was an exaggeration, uh, that uh, nothing serious ca happened and everything's going to be all right and so on, rather than raising the alarm that it should have. Yeah. Yeah. It was Stephen Dorrell who is the author. I was just looking over my shoulder because I knew it was on my shelf somewhere of that MI6 uh, official history. Andrew, that, that's a great summary of the Guzenko affair. And uh, we're lucky to uh, have on the podcast Evie Wilson, who was the daughter of uh, Igor Guzenko. Welcome to Cold War Conversations, Evie. Thank you, thank you Ian. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My parents, they were both Red Army soldiers during World War II. They became GRU by necessity, uh, Everyone in the embassy was either GRU or KGB or belonged to the more senior group that uh, reported directly to Stalin. Uh, it's a very uh, complex case. Uh, the testimony was largely uh, based on the documents. Uh, without the documents, I don't think my parents would have uh, been able to convince anyone. There was just simply too many uh, infiltrations into our system, into our security system that would allow a defector to successfully uh, bring forward his evidence. Was this the, and this is probably a question for both of you, was this the same period when the Venona uh, decoding was going on in the US where they were getting snippets of information about the depth of Soviet penetration? Yes, 
Yes, Sandra, you probably uh, know more about this. Yeah, well, my understanding is that uh, it, it was, yeah, shortly after World War II that all of the previous, you know, uh, uh, recordings of Soviet secret encrypted messages uh, were, were, were subject to, you know, a much more vigorous uh, attempt to decode and, and, and read them. And certainly uh, the information that Guzenko brought to the West uh, added to that, you know, need and, and that impetus to, 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 to do that, to pursue that, that Venona project. Did the Americans use some of the information they got from Venona to corroborate that Guzenko was not, you know, a, a plant or a walk-in? Absolutely. The, um, among the documents that he brought over uh, were the code book uh, that Sabotin used and was supposed to have been destroyed, but it was brought over. And this was a key document, as I understand, in the Venona uh, decryptions. Evie, were you born when they walked out of the, uh, the Soviet embassy or were you, you born a little bit later? I was born a little bit later, Ian. I was uh, born at Campex in December of 1945. Um, my parents were expecting me when they decided to defect. And I mean, this is, has to be a dramatic decision. And you can imagine how uh, difficult that decision would have been. It was certainly, as Andrew had, had pointed out, um, uh, the uh, sequence of events, the uh, bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in early August of 1945 was a tipping point. Uh, at that point, they had access to information. They were certainly knowledgeable about the um, Soviet espionage in the area of atomic um, weaponry. And uh, once the two bombs were detonated and in the hands of Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, this was simply unthinkable to my parents. So. Even though they had one child and another on the way, the decision was taken bravely by my mother and dad to defect, to warn the West. That was their, their entire motivation. You mentioned that you were born in Camp X. What, what was that place and why were your parents sent there? Well, that was eventually a safe house that they were moved to um, after being moved to several other safe houses in the uh, Ottawa area following the uh, defection. And as uh, Andrew had uh, described, there were a series of events before that happened. Uh, once once uh, they were established as um, defectors and their information taken seriously, then they were moved from one safe house to another. And finally, uh, to this safe house in the Oshawa, Whitby area of um, Ontario, on the shores of Lake Ontario. It was a um, training ground during World War II for, so for operatives that who would fall in behind uh, enemy lines uh, during that war. Uh, these were Canadian. American and British uh, operatives who were specially selected and trained. And uh, then once World War II had ended, this became a location that few, but very few knew about and was felt to be the ideal location for uh, a safe house for this family under protective custody. Uh, that's where they were debriefed by various uh, various officials, Canadian officials, American officials, and uh, and those from Great Britain as well. Uh, my my parents' memoirs uh, contain considerable notes on this, and I believe that their autobiographies, my father's autobiography, this was my choice, which became the Iron Curtain movie. And my mother's autobiography, uh, Before Igor, uh, which was written later, uh, were based on those testimonies and those uh, debriefings that they gave at Camp X. Now, this was during my mother's uh, pregnancy and then delivery. And I was delivered at Camp X by the Camp X doctor, Dr. Uh, Millman. 
So where where did you spend your your early childhood then? Not all the time at Camp X. You were moved somewhere else. Well, initially, um, we were uh, kept in protective custody. Uh, my mother was brought out of Camp X to the hospital, the local hospital in uh, in the Oshawa area, with uh, an RCMP officer acting as my my father and. Um, and he spoke perfect Russian as well as, of course, English, and was able to communicate um, the details. My mother spoke only Russian at that time. So when I had to go to the hospital for care, um, they, he acted as the intermediary. My, my dad was not allowed off of the uh, Camp X site. If you're enjoying the content, please consider a monthly donation to support us. You'll get a free Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're preserving Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. Now, back to today's episode. Presumably the concern was that the GRU were going to try and assassinate your father. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the Soviets were well aware, and this is the KGB, who would be the primary arm, the secret police, uh, and uh, the GRU being the Red Army um, uh, group, uh, would have worked in, in uh, tandem to watch the various hospitals in Ontario because they knew that I was about to be born. Uh, so this was a um, one of their strategies to to try and locate us. And uh, they had spoken. In fact, there's evidence that they had spoken to various hospital staff across um, the Ottawa area and uh, and elsewhere. What is your earliest memory, Evie? My earliest memory is interesting, uh, and because uh, I didn't realize that I had retained that memory until, until many, many decades later, uh, I was invited to take part in a CampX documentary, and uh, this documentary brought together all of the those people who, um, at that time, were able to describe their experiences either at Camp X directly being part of the training operatives or um, afterwards that is following the defection and and were housed at the uh, farmhouse on the edge of the Camp X site which acted as a safe house. The earliest memory was Lake Ontario at Camp X and I didn't realize this until I had taken part in that documentary and we walked down with the film crew to the, to the shoreline. Now I had seen not long before I had seen a, a um, an oil painting that was uh, by my father or purportedly by my father and I was asked to confirm is this one of his his uh, works of art and of course it showed the the um, shoreline and uh, a tree on the shoreline and the uh, beach and I remembered yes that that that's his quality of painting. That is a sight that I remember. And sure enough, when I walked down with the crew, I saw exactly that sight. Now, I would have to be two or three years old, no more. I think, you know, visual memory like that is is relatively common. And that must have been quite powerful for you to then experience that when you're with that documentary crew. And suddenly it's like, I've been here before. <laughs> I know this place. It was a shock. Uh, it really felt wonderful and um, overwhelming at the same time. The Canadian government then move you to somewhere more permanent with this cover name. Where, where was that? Well, we were moved to um, an area in the uh, greater Toronto area um, that was at the time um, called Port Credit. It became part of what is now today Mississauga, the town of Mississauga, city of Mississauga. And um, this was kept very, very secret uh, by necessity. Uh, we tried to fit in and live our lives like um, our neighbors. And I think for the most part, we succeeded. Our parents succeeded in doing this. And of course, uh, I cannot overlook the, the great role of the RCMP. Did the RMCP have sort of like permanent sort of coverage to 
keep an eye on you? Well, the RCMP had a, um, um, a mandate at that time, and we were one of the first uh, families in North America under the Witness Protection Program, or what is now the Witness Protection Program. And given a, um, an identity and a cover story, all of this, of course, uh, I did not know growing up until I reached my mid to late teens. And even then, when I learned the true story, I did not fully understand it. It took years, decades, before I could comprehend the uh, the complex politics behind this uh, uh, these events and understand what it is that my parents had done because there's so there was so much misinformation published. I, I mean, I'm interested to know what what you know what your experiences were prior to you being 16 in so much of your your family life did you know that there was something strange about the family that wasn't like perhaps the other families or the other children that you knew uh when you were in school absolutely uh when you're growing up in that environment in that community we stood out because we were the only immigrants that's number one uh, there were no other immigrants at that time. And I have to qualify this because I am the leading edge in the family. My older brother, Andrea, myself, and my um, younger sister, who is now past, uh, Alexandria, are, um, uh, we're, the three of us were uh, in this unique family in the community. Number one, my parents were immigrants. No one else were immigrants. This was prior to pizza, prior to the... Uh, you know, the um, the great shift in, in our society to invite and encourage immigrants into Canada uh, to become the meeting place nation that we are, uh, that we certainly are today. But at that time, there weren't any in the community. We were the, we were the odd family out. And so for that reason alone, I gravitated towards uh, anyone I knew at school that had uh, any um, uh, similarity to my, my, own, my own experience. And those were the families that, that uh, I connected with. Um, one of my friends at, at public school was um, Evelyn Meth, and she was uh, of Czechoslovakian heritage. My family background was uh, Czechoslovakian. And of course, I'm, uh, I gravitated to Evelyn because her name was the same as mine, Evelyn, uh, my first name, even though I've got to qualify this as well. My first name was really uh, quite different, uh, given at Camp X. And, and when we established the, um, the cover story name, it became Evelyn. And uh, my mother and dad never, ever called me Evelyn in their entire life. It was always Evie, 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 um, Evenka. And uh, that was what I related to. My, my siblings called me Evie, Evie, and uh, never Evelyn. But uh, going back to the friends in the neighborhood, that was one of my experiences. My other friend was Anne Tang, also of uh, an ethnic origin. Many, many of my friends uh, at that time in public school, um, I still remember them very, very dearly. They all had something different from me, though. The one profound difference from from my friends and, and our families, we had no relatives. We had no grandma, no grandpa, no aunts and uncles, no cousins and nephews and so on. They, were, they didn't exist. So we were unique in that respect as well. And I felt a great deal of um, distance uh, than from others uh, who had this structure around them. And we gravitated to our friends and neighbors as our external family and became very close to some of the neighbors. Uh, as I learned much later, many of the neighbors were in fact RCMP or part of the um, department in the federal government that overlooks uh, you know, protects people in uh, in a community, and we were of course the special charges at the time. And I think that because of that infrastructure, we were able to survive where other defectors and their families were not. So the background cover that you were given was that you were a Czechoslovak family. Is that correct? 
That is correct. Yes, that was the cover story. A name was given to us, a um, a, a history. Although it was, it, it had too many holes. There were just too many things that didn't connect. For example, my mother could not get a um, a proper citizenship in her um, protected name. We had citizenship given to us, ironically, by King George the Sixth, prior to our. Um, our cover story, and this was given to us in our original name, Kuzienka. My brother appears on it, on this uh, certificate of citizenship, uh, Andrea Kuzienko, and mine was appears as Evelyn Kuzienko, and then my mother and dad, Svetlana and, and Igor, on this beautiful document that gives us British Canadian uh, citizenship. Uh, however, we can't use it because it was in the original name. And life in our society depends on a background, a proper background that identifies you as a uh, immigrant family. The original story had us all, all four of us, um, emigrating into Canada from uh, Czechoslovakia. My parents protested saying, no, 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 uh, Andrea was born in Ottawa and you know, uh, he's a Canadian citizen by birth. I was born in Camp X, a Canadian citizen by birth and didn't want even the uh, cover story, the legend as it's described, the legend, to say that we were brought in from another country, that we were in fact born on Canadian soil, uh, which is the fact. We were indeed born on Canadian soil. All of their children were born on Canadian soil, including myself and my older brother. Because you knew that you had a Czech background as as your legend, and this was when you were quite young, so you, you believed that you were Czech, you tried to bring some Czech school friends home and uh, your parents didn't react too well to that uh it wasn't a matter of bringing them home what i wanted to do was introduce my parents to their parents i i was good friends with evelyn meth and and uh, i remember her to this day uh, and I wanted so much because they were of the same background as us. I believe they spoke the same language. I had no means of dis- distinguishing our parents' language. And I learned a lot of the language because, as I said, my mother spoke only Russian when I was born. And so I picked up, I picked up the language until a point came uh, where our parents just strongly discouraged us from using the language. Uh, anyway, going back to Evelyn, um, yes, I tried to have my parents meet with her parents, and I was met with a lot of inexplicable resistance, <laughs> and I, I thought I had done a wonderful thing. can't recall exactly how they um, described this, this to me. They were understanding and yet um, very stern that um, uh, really we shouldn't be meeting with other people. And there were good reasons for it. Um, I, as a young child, didn't delve into it any further. Later in life, of course, I did speak to my mother about this once I had the great opportunity later in life to get to really know my mother. And that was just simply by circumstance uh, following my father's passing. I know that your mother spoke to you when you were 16 and told you the the truth. Can you remember that occasion and what what was that like? That was a powerful impact. Um, It was um, uh, following a series of events and finally reaching a crescendo uh, in high school when someone confronted me and um, it was a very demeaning confrontation. In other words, saying that my parents were spies and and, um, more than implying actually ridiculing and putting down my parents and and uh, it was a very difficult experience for me so I I came back home and I said to mom uh, she was in the kitchen and you know this is interesting Ian because I spoke to my younger sister in the family and about um, her experiences and I we spoke about your questions and it was so fascinating to hear her responses she was 
very young at that point. When I came into the kitchen with mom after high school, after a, a day at high school, and, and I, I uh, said, mom, you forgot to tell me what's going on. I really can't deal with this. Uh, you know, I have to know what's happening because there's something unusual. And I, um, uh, she was working in the kitchen. And the, clearly my youngest sis, uh, sister and brother, the twins, were uh, in a uh, crib somewhere nearby. I don't have a clear recollection of where they were at that time. But she was extremely busy woman, uh, a mother, handling a huge family. And now she has her, her eldest daughter come in and uh, ask these very difficult questions. She kept working away, but was very direct and said, yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. We are Russians. And she said, but it's not what you think or what they're saying. It's very um, complicated. And uh, uh, all you need to know is that uh, what happened was, um, was the right thing. Now, I'm, I'm paraphrasing because my mother used different words. Uh, she... Uh, my fears at rest um, by her, you know, her honesty. And she said that we have to be extremely careful. This is a very dangerous time. You know, these are the 1960s. If you'll recall some of the history of what was happening at that time, you can uh, transpose the events on the family events, which is what I've done in my, uh, my own um, memoirs. And, and it's so fascinating to see because I know my parents were deeply involved in these events, the Bay of Pigs and, you know, on and on. There was a, many Cold War confrontations happening. And uh, so when she tried to explain to me what had happened, I had only a slight inkling at that time that we were indeed Russians uh, of Russian heritage, that the Russians were the considered the evil empire. So she stressed that while she's telling me this truth, that I don't fully understand it, I, I can't possibly understand it, there's simply too much, but please understand that you cannot corroborate this with anyone, not even your siblings. You can't even speak to your siblings about this. So, and, and certainly even in our conversation yesterday with my younger sister, she refers it to it as the G, the G word, meaning the Guzhenko, the, um, the surname Guzhenko. And I only recently learned how to pronounce it properly. <laughs> I would pronounce it Guzhenko, and that is incorrect. It was Guzhenko with an A, on, A sound on the end. So these, these are the nuances in, in that whole event that took place way back in the 1960s when, um, before I was married. It, it sounds like, you, you know, it was quite pressurized living in that household because you knew that there were secrets that need to be kept and you couldn't tell people out, outside the, the household. And, you know, from, from some of the, the, the information I've read, you know, around the story, you did find some sort of refuge from the pressures of home at school. Absolutely. Uh, school and uh, being in part of the community was, uh, was wonderful. Um, there is a quality of life in Canada that we, um, we enjoy and we just take for granted. It is uh, it's how casual we are. In a Soviet system, and certainly my parents were born and raised in under Soviet communism. They were experts in their field um, by necessity, and they brought that history home. And uh, that was part of who they were, who they are. And yet they embraced and enjoyed uh, Canadian freedoms um, as, as uh, anyone would as many refugees from terror would uh, describe it's uh, it's a huge relief for us um just being canadians among our you know immediate community and 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 in our school systems uh and you know friends with uh, our high school students the majority of that life and that experience was wonderful 
uh, I loved it. I loved every moment of it. And yes, it made studying very easy. And this is something that our parents uh, uniquely, because a lot of Canadians don't um, don't cherish uh, the arts and the sciences and the and the academia as our parents did. That was part of their Soviet experience. So they brought that home. My mother was um, an excellent, outstanding pianist. I don't know if you know that, but she, she played piano very well and she played for the embassy events. That was part of her, her job. Um, there were many other tasks that she had as well at the embassy. And I became then a star for my mom and dad <laughs> because I enjoyed academia so, so much. I enjoyed studying. When I had some problems in certain subjects, uh, they came to my rescue. Um, I think one of the experiences that my brother described was, was sensational, how my mother was doing her hair and he came to her with a with a uh, mathematics problem and she's doing her hair and he's um, asking her this question and she said, oh, oh yes, the hypotenuse. Uh, and he's saying hypotenuse. He's trying to understand what she's saying. And of course he comes back and says hypotenuse, hypotenuse, mom. You're talking about the hypotenuse, <laughs> not a hypotenuse. She said, no, 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 the correct pronunciation is hypotenuse. <laughs> So we would go back and forth like this. But the point is, my mother was brilliant. She was a brilliant academic uh, student in, in her university years. She aspired up to, um, to university in Moscow. And that's where dad and mom met. And they're both of their primary interests in life were, of course, their family, but then their artwork. And that was all eclipsed by the politics. Uh, however, they were good soldiers in World War II, and that's one of the strongest stories I want to emphasize is that they were good soldiers, uh, good allies in the war World War II, right up until the end of World War II. They were on front lines. They did their duty. And one of the last words my mother asked me, is she said, did I, I did my duty, didn't I? And I said, more than, above and beyond. And, uh, and I'll never forget those words she, she said to me because she felt that um, her life and her, her main purpose in life was to warn the West. And did she succeed? I would think she did. I would think they did. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, a lovely story you, you, you've just told me there. Um, I, I understand that at, at some point your mailbox got blown up. There were many, many incidents. That was one of the more um, uh, memorable uh, events because I was at a certain age and, and I believe it was, um, yeah, it was early high school. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't in public school. That was early high school, if I recall correctly. And that mailbox uh, stayed on the driveway for so many years just laying down there. And of course, I, uh, I looked at it and I, I wondered why on earth is it keeping this, this relic? Uh, you know, I analyzed this over a number of years and I said, this is so odd. There's a, um, com compared to the story that my parents gave me, they said, oh, it was just somebody shooting up mailboxes and not to worry, it's just a, a bunch of pranksters. You know, they tried to subdue the fear in the story and certainly wouldn't uh, suggest it was any kind of projectile or bomb. Uh, but it was. It, uh, the um, mailbox was blown outward from the inside. It was puffed out from the inside. There was a, a coating of some type of uh, ash or materials on the inside. And the flap itself was uh, a... Um, uh, bigger than a bullet hole, much bigger, uh, projecting out of the flap, not, you know, if somebody was shooting up mailboxes, it would be from the in outside inward, but this was from the inside outward. And I noticed this and I, I said, you know, this is really odd. Why, why would anybody do this? Why would there be um, this kind of a problem? And uh, it was clear to me many years later that that was an, a pipe bomb. Uh, on the inside, and it was somehow detonated, not by anyone in the family, but by another uh, 
uh, someone else. Somehow, the um, the they escaped injury. Who would have done that? I mean, An- Andrew, is there s- sort of a criminal investigation or anything in the records that says that this was investigated by the RMCP? I, I'm not aware of any specifically relating to that, but I think it's worthwhile to notice that in uh, the Matrokin archive, there is a reference to, I, I believe it was uh, Shelipin, who uh, provided a, a, a list within the KGB of defectors who were on the KGB hit list. And the, elder, the, the oldest name of, 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 of the, the targets was Guzenko. So, you know, from that we know that the Soviets had a, 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 a beef. Yeah, <laughs> a long memory to, as a well. A long memory. And uh, one always has to suspect that they had a hand in it. E- how how did you manage to meet your husband in in such a constrained and and sort of secret <laughs> environment? Isn't that an interesting question? Uh, yes, um, that was a high school experience. Uh, my brother had become friends with uh, Brian Wilson, not not the not the Beach Boy. <laughs> I always qualify this. Yes, I married uh, Brian Wilson uh, in 1962. That puts puts it in in place. But um, he was a, a mature high school student that returned from the Air Force back to high school. He was 21 years old then. I was uh, 15 um, when I think we first met, and that was through my brother because uh, Brian had come over. He was interested in what uh, my brother was doing, and uh, there were other um, things that they had in common and uh, my brother of course is is two years older than me and uh, Brian was um, in the more senior group at that time Uh, and uh, that's basically how we met Uh, he was driving driving his motorcycle uh, into the driveway waiting for my brother I had walked out onto the driveway Brian was on his motorcycle and we connected Um, he thought I was my brother's mother, for some reason, a bit of, a bit of shock because I was obviously young. Um, and we went for a motorcycle ride, and I guess the rest is fate. Uh, there's a lot more to the story, and that will have to stay in my, uh, my memoirs. When my mother emphasized the need for retaining complete confidentiality, I respected that. And besides, I had so limited knowledge about what the truth was even the name, uh, that I couldn't share that with anyone. I certainly didn't share it with Brian. Uh, Brian seemed to know a lot. I can say that. You know, over the uh, we were married for 10 years, and uh, during that time, um, there were many things that happened, and I, I forgot to say it was an experience, unusual. Uh, I wish, it, you know, we had been able to do things differently, but it it didn't end well. I'm very sorry for that because uh, of the impact on my own children. You know, it affects the background affects not just my my marriage, but every one of my siblings' marriages and our children and their and the impacts on our children is quite profound, quite profound. Uh, to this day, I believe that many of them don't understand the full truth and the full story. They don't even understand the most basic which is that my parents warned the West. That was their primary motivation. I I was going to ask you, um, did you actually tell Brian um, what your father had done at any point? He brought up the subject. This is interesting because it was him that raised certain issues. And I would find myself in a place of defending myself against what this was saying to me. And and it got into a difficult um, confrontation. Uh, And I would um, feel dejected because it felt uh, as if I had to constantly defend myself and defend my parents. Um, He had a great sense of humor 
I forgot to qualify this, but the humor was a put down humor. Um, but at times it was uh, uh, remarkably witty. And um, I always admired, even though he didn't reach, um, he wasn't um, academic. He wasn't able to learn in an academic environment, much much like others I knew. And, and the academic um, environment uh, rather offended them. Um, but they became very street smart. They were very intelligent people. My mother loved uh, Brian, uh, thought that he was clever enough to be an unscrupulous lawyer. And if he had chosen that path, he would have become a very good lawyer. Do you know what happened to your mother and father's relatives who were still in the Soviet Union? I uh, learned over a period of decades, the first um, awareness that they survived was for my mother's family. And uh, this came through the Red Cross from Siberia. When our um, last, uh, my mother's um, older sister got in touch with us through the Red Cross by some miracle. We were able to write to her and we were able to exchange materials with her. And we tried very valiantly to bring her here to Canada to visit. Uh, she had a daughter, um, Tatiana, uh, who was born before the defection. Uh, she was a little older than me. This would be my um, cousin and uh, my aunt, Alia's daughter, Alia is the one that survived in uh, the Siberia. Uh, her story was very dramatic. Um, and uh, the story of how they survived uh, is also very dramatic. But my, my grandmother and grandfather, my mother's mother and, and dad, were able to survive. Uh, they were imprisoned following the defection, uh, Soviet style, separated in, in the middle of the night and brought away. Nobody knew what was happening and they were fiercely interrogated and uh, brought to um, prison separately and didn't, weren't able to reunite till five years later. And that was in, in Siberia, never allowed to return to Moscow. Um, and um, uh, eventually my aunt was able to break away from this small, uh, I believe it's a, um, a village that acts like a gulag. You cannot go out of it and foreigners were not allowed into that village. Uh, and that's where they survived from the time they were able to reunite. And that would be my, uh, my mother, my mother's mother, like my grandmother, my granddad and my aunt Alia. Uh, I was named after Alia, by the way. It, my original name had um, the English style with the first name and the second name, um, and uh, the last name, the original Gizhenko. Um It was um, uh, named after Alia, and uh, that my dad and mom agreed to uh, to that name. But because it was so ethnic, uh, when they gave us a cover story, they had to change it to Evelyn Ellen. And I became a very anglicized name, Evelyn Ellen Wilson, by marriage, which has great irony in it, of course. But it was uh, it was wonderful. It's the name that I have all my degrees in and and my full uh, life's uh, career. So I, I retained it. But I've gone back to Evie, to my original Evie. And it's as close as I'm to uh, my original name. Anyway, they did survive, uh, Ian, just going back yeah. to your original question. Uh, that was on my mother's side. My father's side was not as successful, but there is an interesting story of, uh, of a reunion later on. Uh, my, my grandmother, uh, my mother, my dad's mom uh, died in, in Lubyanka under interrogation. Uh, she had, they blamed it on a heart condition, but we all know better. I mean, the interrogation was fierce. Uh, Stalin believed that this was, um, uh, you know, a planned defection that um, their um, uh, they had made contact much earlier with the um, Americans and British and and Canadians, and that's just not true. So, Andrew, you've 
been looking at this case for for a number of years, but I understand that you've had quite a a battle to get the case suitably commemorated in Ottawa. Yes, and uh, you know, the, I was a teenager in the late 1970s when uh, I heard about the Guzenko story. That was the first time I heard about it, and the more I I heard about it, and of course he died in 1982, so the the media carried a number of uh, stories about, about him at that time, as well as a couple of books that had been published. And um, I always considered him, from, from the first time I heard about his story, that he was a hero for the courage that he displayed in, in, in doing what he did. And, and I always thought anybody who gave uh, KGB and the NKVD a hard time, especially in Canada, were heroes. And nobody gave the NKVD in a harder time in Canada than, than Igor Guzenko. And I moved to Ottawa in 1989, and I visited Dundonald Park in downtown Ottawa, across the street from 511, which is the two-story uh, little apartment building where Igor and Svetlana lived at the time of their defection. And I could not believe that there was no memorial, no plaque, no, no, no marker, no statue, nothing, no, no monument to, to commemorate that something very significant that affected not just Ottawa and Canada, but the entire world and effectively was a milestone at the beginning of the Cold War was not marked. You know, about 10 years later, I had moved into the neighborhood and I used to walk by the park uh, on a regular basis. And I, I was just so fed up of waiting for somebody to do something that I began a process of lobbying the federal government and the municipal government of the city of Ottawa, asking them to recognize the event that took place at that location and to erect some historic plaque. Eventually, I got a letter from about within a, a, a period of time from the mayor of Ottawa, Jim Watson, and he said, this is a great idea. I'm going to discuss it with city staff. And eventually, I got a letter from him saying, we're going to unveil the plaque before the end of the year, 2000 at that time. And at the same time, I managed in my research to find a, a connection and a phone number to reach Evie. And I contacted Evie and spoke with her and found out that Svetlana Guzenko was still alive. And I was so hopeful that the city would unveil this historic plaque commemorating the courage of the Vizenko family and that Svetlana would be able to come and witness this event and I'd finally be able to meet my hero. Unfortunately, what happened was city politics, um, the mayor resigned, the city went through a period of reorganization and amalgamation and the bureaucrats unilaterally decided to postpone the event, which I thought was a disaster. The Department of Foreign Affairs told them not to unveil any such plaque because it might offend the Russians. That sounds like it's going in full circle from Mackenzie King right the way through to the 2000s. Yes, exactly. But I applied <laughs> to the Department of Canadian Heritage where there's a special board called the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, and they kept delaying it and delaying it, but eventually... They made a positive recommendation to the minister, and in 2002, I received a letter that the Minister of Canadian Heritage had officially designated the Guzenko Affair of 1945 to 1946 as being a significant event in Canadian history, and she committed the uh, department to unveil a federal historic plaque in the park, and that was expected to take place approximately two years later. So immediately the city re re reversed itself and said they're going to do a, a, a review of their policy. And sure enough, they decided that they were going to not only unveil a plaque, but unveil it a year earlier than the federal government. And so in 2003, the city unveiled a plaque, a beautiful plaque with pictures of um, Luzenko with his trademark 
hood to protect his identity on it with uh, one of the actresses who uh, played in one of the movies called Operation Manhunt in the 1950s, which was based on the Guzenko story, a picture of the Soviet embassy that existed at, at the time of the defection, which in fact burnt down in the 1950s. And so that's history. And then there's a picture of the building itself where Guzenko lived. And then in 2004, the federal government unveiled a historic plaque Evie's younger sister came to the unveiling at the city plaque and she was approached by the national news, TV news, and asked if she would like to say a few words on television, on, on, on camera. And up until then, she always refused. Evie became effectively the, the spokesperson for the family, but on this occasion, she did. And she said that to be able to say the name Guzenko and her name in the same sentence was a wonderful feeling. And that aired on national TV that evening. And a few days later, she wrote an email to me which, in which she said that over the weekend, many of her friends who had no idea what her background was contacted her and she felt that a veil and had been lifted off her identity, and she felt a new sense of freedom that she'd never have felt before. And when I got that email, I was so touched that I, I framed it, and I have it on the wall, because I think, if nothing else, that four and a half years, I lobbied the governments for those historic plaques, at least this, this this impact that it had on, on Evie's sister was something that truly made it all worthwhile. The unfortunate thing, of course, was that Svetlana passed away in 2001, but at least the, the plaques are there and any, any visitor to Don Donald Park in downtown Ottawa can, can go by in the park, they'll see directly across the street from the entrance to 511 Somerset Street are two beautiful historic plaques dedicated to the commemoration of the courage of Igor and Svetlana Gizenko and the warning that they gave to Canada and the Western Allies of the nature of the Soviet Union. And we have further information such as videos and links, including details of Andrew's book, in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Frederick Esposito, Jack Madwed, Todd Lemieux, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.